Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jeremy Sugarman. I'm um, one of the co-principal investigators for um, an NIH Fogarty grant uh, that's based at the University of Malaya um, in cooperation with Johns Hopkins called Mori's Masters of Research Ethics Studies um, program. Um, during my day job, I work at the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Johns Hopkins University. Um, thanks for joining us for the first in a series of webinars on hot topics in research ethics. Um, before we uh, launch this series, I just wanna tell you that today, uh, Nancy Cass, as you know, uh, will be giving our first um, talk. We're gonna have a series of, of these um, sessions over the year the academic year and you can see some of the speakers. The precise dates and timing have not yet been um, settled, um, but we do anticipate uh, that the remainder of the um, series will be based um, more uh, the reverse um, so that there'll be morning in um, Southeast Asia and evening um, in the United States. We figured it was best to have the speakers as alert as possible. Um, and the listeners could, could sit back. And so um, that was our rationale for, for doing it um, this way. Um, before we introduce Nancy and get going, I'm gonna turn it over to my um, colleague, CJ, who's gonna tell you just a little bit about uh, the Mores um, program. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Chuck Jen Ng, a professor of family medicine at the University of Malaya. I'm also the program coordinator for this program, uh, Master of Health Research Ethics, Mori. So as you can see in this picture, these are our first uh, batch of uh, Maury students who have graduated. Let me just uh, give you just a few words about this Master of Health Research Ethics program. This is a one-year full-time program that um, has been going on for the past one year. And um, the application opens May and the intake is usually in September and October. Maury aims to produce graduate equipped with the knowledge and skills necessary to engage in the field of health research ethics. So this program, as mentioned by um, Jeremy, it's a collaboration between Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, and the Berman Institute of Bioethics, supported by the U.S. National Institute of Health, Fogarty International Center. So the co-PI in, in the University of Malaya is Professor Adiba, who is with us today. Also in, in this particular web video, hi, Professor Adiba. And there are 10 scholarships for applicants from low and middle income country in the Southeast Asian region. So, so I think that's basically, in a nutshell, what Master of Health Research Ethics is. So there's uh, more information, thank you, CJ, um, at the website, and please go there, take a look at it. There's a lot of information about the program. We're always looking for great applicants. Our second cohort of students has started, um, despite COVID, and um, moving right along. So um, if you're really interested in research ethics and, and want to learn more about it, please um, go there. So um, it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce my um, friend and colleague, Nancy Cass. Um, Nancy is the um, Vice Provost for Graduate and Professional Education and the Phoebe R. Berman Professor of Bioethics and Public Health at, at Johns Hopkins. She's also the Deputy Director for Public Health at the Berman Institute of Bioethics and a Professor of Health Policy and Management in the School of Public Health. Nancy's well known internationally for her work in bioethics and health policy and has worked on a variety of issues in research ethics as well as organize several Fogarty training programs um, in, in Africa. Um, and uh, Nancy and I started to meet, uh, we met a long time ago now um, with a different um, epidemic. We worked initially on a project um, in the early 1990s on AIDS and the ethical issues surrounding AIDS and, and the work um, together continues. Um, she's also worked in, in Geneva for WHO and um, knows an awful lot about lots of topics. I'm gonna hand it over to her uh, for her topic. Um, before we do, just uh, as a reminder uh, that we have, um, once you've joined the webinar, we have your audio and video turned off automatically. Um, please type your questions into the chat box um, and the moderators, that's uh, CJ and myself, will try to address them um, during the Q&A session. So we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, we are recording this session, so if you um, object to that, please turn it off, um, and you can also uh, maintain your confidentiality to a certain extent by, by keeping your camera off um, and not speaking. So um, we just wanna make sure everyone's aware of that. So let me now turn this over to Nancy and we'll hear about challenge studies um, in COVID. Thank you, Jeremy and CJ. What a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, so let me, let me uh, share my screen. 
and get into slideshow mode. Okay. Um, I'm assuming everybody can see that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be with all of you. And um, I really enjoyed getting to know some of the faculty from Malaysia when they came to the Berman Institute back in that era when we were all able to travel and collaborate in a different way. We look forward to that again. And as Jeremy mentioned, I have a, a, a very um, strong um, respect for and affection for all of these Fogarty programs um, having, uh, have, having worked with so many um, ourselves. So, um, so the, the, the theme for this series is hot topics in research ethics and we're all living um, with this global pandemic and uh, it seemed to me that one of the hot topics in research ethics right now is the question of how to design trials to test um, uh, novel vaccines for the novel coronavirus. And there is, as I'm sure so many of you know, a very active debate about essentially the pros and cons of adding challenge studies to the mix in addition to or instead of traditional phase three trials. And again, for those of you who follow this world, you may know that the United Kingdom has now um, essentially approved in concept going forward with challenge studies in the United States where I live and work while there has been some preparation just in case that has not been approved. So what I'm going to do is start by talking about areas of agreement. Um, there are certain things that I think everybody in ethics and science agrees should be part of any kind of COVID vaccine research study. I'm going to introduce for a moment what challenge studies are because I don't want to assume that everybody on the call is familiar with that lingo. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the scientific arguments that people have put forward for challenge studies and scientific arguments uh, where people are concerned that challenge studies won't do as well as traditional phase three trials. The ethical arguments, and I don't mean by separating these to suggest that they're not interrelated. All of us who work in research ethics know that if a trial is not good scientifically, it is sort of dead on arrival in terms of ethics. Um, one of the premier requirements for research ethics is that the research itself be valid scientifically and be able to produce the social value we want it to do, but I am going to separate those for the sake of being a little systematic in our thinking, and then we'll open it up to discussion. Okay, so, so let me start, as I said, with the part about where is there agreement? Um, and I actually think it's very important to start with where there's agreement. So there's agreement um, globally that developing a safe and effective vaccine against COVID is essential. And I think it's fair to say that everybody agrees that the more quickly we have a vaccine that we know works and that we know is safe, the better. We must be fairly confident about safety and efficacy before any vaccine can be approved. And all studies carry risk. So whether we're talking about a challenge study or a phase three trial, which is the more traditional way, um, we must identify what those risks are. We must do everything we can to minimize those risks. And then obviously, the, once we have done that and done our side from the sort of protectionist angle of research ethics, then we must do our best to have a valid informed consent process. So the usual way of testing a vaccine for safety and effectiveness um, once a vaccine has gotten through some amount of preclinical testing to allow the scientists to believe that it is promising and it's time to start testing it with human beings, is in this three-phase um, chronology. So phase one is where the researchers start with a small um, number of people, usually fewer than 100, sometimes considerably fewer than 100, and the purpose is to see if the vaccine is safe. It's literally the first time that this is injected in a human being's arm, and everybody wants to make sure that terrible things don't happen. And so usually these are run gradually. Um, and then there is also the opportunity to see if there is some immunogenicity. What is the immune response of even those smaller numbers of people? If a vaccine makes it out of phase one, 
In other words, if it is safe and there is some immunogenicity, it moves on to a larger trial, phase two, usually with a few hundred people. Phase two trials start generally to target uh, the same populations who might be the prime targets for the vaccine, which isn't necessarily true in phase one. Um, and uh, it is again looking for any uh, safety problems and some immunogenicity and, and starting to pay attention more to dosing and schedule. And if it gets out of phase two, then the vaccine traditionally is uh, tested through a phase three trial. This is usually randomized. It's usually placebo control. And um, certainly in this case, we've all been hearing about very, very large phase three trials. One of the big ones happening um, organized uh, through the United States, um, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute, the Moderna trial, um, uh, just finished enrolling 30,000 people. So tens of thousands of people, again, in the target populations, randomized to the experimental vaccine or a placebo vaccine. And again, now looking for safety, for efficacy, um, and, and for some laboratory immunogenicity data. Okay, so what's a challenge study? Challenge studies vaccinate participants in the same way a phase three uh, trial would, but then deliberately infect those vaccinated participants once there's been enough time to um, assume that some kind of immune response would have happened already in those participants with the organism that causes a disease. These are done because they are thought to provide both a very direct and a very efficient way to measure efficacy and safety. So challenge studies have certainly pre-existed COVID. They have been used for um, uh, malaria vaccine trials, for typhoid, for cholera, um, at Johns Hopkins where I work, um, which is one of you know, many institutions across the world that has had vaccine development researchers uh, for a very long time. Challenge studies are done. As a matter of fact, I teach uh, research ethics to graduate students and we have often had a participant come in and speak to the class who participated in a malaria uh, challenge study. He talks about how he got sicker than he had ever felt in his entire life. He was in the hospital and he recovered. So that becomes a key piece of the ethics of challenge trials. Challenge trials are uh, ordinarily allowed, and I'll get to this in a minute, only when the disease that the participant is challenged with, essentially is injected with or exposed to the real disease, um, either will resolve on its own um, or is treatable. So ethically, challenge studies have been approved historically by research ethics committees only when all of the following are true. The disease in question, think malaria or cholera, is either not very severe, or if it is severe, is reversible either on its own or with treatments, which are sometimes in the context of challenge studies called rescue medicines. Participants who are thought to be at higher risk, for example, it really wouldn't be good if a pregnant woman was uh, given malaria, um, are excluded. And of course, again, informed consent. So there has been extraordinary debate in the academic literature, in the popular press, and certainly behind closed doors among all of the scientists about COVID challenge studies. Are they better scientifically and are they acceptable ethically? So let me go through the scientific arguments that have been put forward, um, including in the ethics literature for those who are proponents of challenge studies. The first and I think primary argument that is put forward is that they can be done um, much more quickly and with many fewer participants. So you don't need to wait in a challenge study for these tens of thousands of people to go about their lives and wait until someone happens to be exposed to another person with COVID you know exactly when it is, um, you know exactly by when 
the person who was vaccinated ought to be protected based on the science behind the trial. Let's say it's two months after vaccination. And at that point, you expose them. They're in the, essentially they're in this controlled environment and you expose them then. So two or three months in, you can already figure out whether someone who was exposed, who was vaccinated, gets COVID or not. And if they get COVID, how sick are they going to be? Or do they have a mild case? It also can be considerably smaller because you know that every single person in the trial will be challenged. One of the reasons why traditional phase three trials are so enormous is because we don't know, and quite honestly, ethically, we hope that most of those participants won't be exposed. So you can have a considerably smaller trial. Um, and uh, that turns out ethically to be, it, it is not only more efficient, it turns out ethically to be advantageous because part of the point of testing these vaccines, as I keep saying, is not only to see if they work, if they're efficacious, but if they're safe. And if it turns out they're not safe and they cause all sorts of pretty bad, scary things, it would be better to have had 50 people vaccinated than 30,000 people vaccinated. There's a lot more precision, goes the scientific argument. Again, we know exactly when the exposure was, so we can learn exactly to what degree it is or isn't uh, protective. Um, we will know, they will know, one will know, the percentage of people who were vaccinated um, who became infected, right? So let's say 30 people are vaccinated, 30 people are um, uh, challenged with COVID, and uh, 10 of them get ill with COVID and 20 don't. You have learned that the vaccine at very least did not protect about a third of the people. In a traditional trial, we can never know exactly what percentage of the people were exposed. Again, 30,000 people are going about the world leading their lives, generally, as I'll say in a minute, higher risk people. And that means higher risk of exposure um, are invited to be part of these phase three trials. But nonetheless, we never really know how many of those people would have gotten COVID anyway by virtue of their exposure. So then it's hard to know exactly what percentage of those exposed people um, uh, became infected and, and how efficacious the vaccine really is. This is a, a diagram taken from um, an article by Nir Eyal, who's an ethicist um, at Rutgers in the United States, who was one of the first people in the bioethics world to publish an article on ethics of um, human challenge trials in COVID, who came out as a proponent for challenge trials. And this diagram, as you can see, um, essentially has a part for sort of what would happen in a challenge trial and what would happen in your traditional phase three trials. In both cases, there would be this uh, starting with phase one and two trials for dose finding immunogenicity and initial safety. What's interesting is that they then say you would go on to the human challenge trial, figure out if it is efficacious, if through that direct challenge, the vaccine um, seems to be working. And if it's working, then go on to a larger scale, short-term safety study that would now enroll more people. They say about 3,000 people to see if when the vaccine is administered to larger groups of people, um, more safety signals that are very rare emerge or not. And again, in contrast to the phase three study. So scientific arguments against challenge studies. Again, I'll get to the core ethics arguments in a minute. The scientific, one scientific argument against challenge studies says if you can only get the lowest people to participate, in other words, part of the ethics argument is, well, let's put some of the lower risk people, the younger adults in these trials where we're more confident they're not going to get a catastrophic case of the disease. If you only can include the lowest risk people ethically in a challenge trial, how will you know if it works or is safe in higher risk populations? Obviously, a target group for a COVID vaccine are people at much older, in much older age groups. 
And then secondly, with enrollments this small, how do you identify those rare but critically important to identify safety signals? So let's talk about um, core ethics arguments. People who are proponents of challenge studies say that the benefit to risk ratio, something that is sort of uh, 101, step one in research ethics evaluations of any study, is high. So the argument goes, we get a much larger and quicker benefit payoff for a smaller risk because you're exposing so many fewer people to the vaccine. So it's the fastest way to learn how to prevent more death when hundreds of thousands of people are dying. And while we wait for a phase three trial, the argument go, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people, uh, tens of thousands of people globally are dying as we wait. So the argument is to some degree utilitarian. It's saying if we can learn much more quickly, if we can learn in three months what would otherwise take seven months or eight months, those months represent, those months saved represent tens of thousands of lives saved. Now, I'll get to this in a minute, but we all know that societal benefit cannot justify extreme risk, extreme and irreversible risk to individual participants, no matter how large the societal benefit is. This is a core piece of research ethics that we not only are required to look at the risk benefit ratio, but we are also required to look at the absolute risk to which participants might be exposed. And there are certain risks that research ethics will not allow participants to be exposed to no matter what the size of the societal payoff. But the people who are proponents of COVID challenge trials are smart, they're thoughtful, they're sophisticated. They acknowledge that and say, but we think these risks genuinely can be managed. So they say only enroll the lowest risk adults. Particular proposal is adults under the age of 30 who have no known pre-existing conditions. Run the study in a high risk isolation unit of hospitals and many hospitals in research environments have these separate research unit for hospitals where it's thought to be safest to have the participants um, in the hospital as an inpatient essentially being monitored. This both, both ensures that the best care and immediate access to an intensive care unit is available for anybody who becomes not only um, truly infected but seriously ill and also honestly reduces the chance from a public health perspective that someone who, be, who is a participant and becomes infected to COVID will be a risk to others. Only 30 to 50 participants, and again, um, some rescue care available, access to an ICU, uh, remdesivir, um, and, and other treatments as well. And again, only informed people um, should volunteer. And I put up here some of you who have um, who, are, who have some familiarity with this issue will know about this website called One Day Sooner. Um, it was started by people who think that um, there may be a lot of other people like themselves who would like to be a COVID hero um, and would like to volunteer. And there are tens of thousands of people who have signed up and expressed interest in being part of a challenge study. Okay, so let's go to the other side here. What are the ethics concerns? And I put in red um, what I think is really the primary concern. This is that the uncertainty about what the true risk for those participants is, is just too high. Well, absolutely, the proponents of a COVID challenge trial want to enroll the lowest risk adults statistically. Again, these younger adults who don't have known uh, pre-existing conditions, we all know by watching the um, epidemiology that some people, even in very low risks, get ill. They're the outliers. It's a surprise. It's tragic. But some people end up getting very ill. Some people die. Some people seem to be having these long-term sequelae that people are trying to figure out but has not been figured out. 
So the challenge itself could cause irreversible harm. And that's one of the golden rules of the ethics of challenge studies, that they're not supposed to do that. And then as I alluded to a minute ago, while societal benefit is critically important in research ethics, of course, it can never justify the highest levels of risks to participants. There are strict limits on how much risk participants can experience regardless of the magnitude of the potential benefit. That is, research ethics is not entirely utilitarian. It is somewhat utilitarian and unabashedly so, but it is not entirely utilitarian. Societal benefit is important, but it can't justify irreversible significant harm to participants. Of course that happens sometimes in research, but it happens when we weren't expecting it, when we didn't think that that was going to be um, one of the risks of a study. And note here, and this is sort of true in research ethics more broadly, a tension between protectionism and autonomy. There are all of these adults who have signed up on the One Day Sooner website autonomously, eyes wide open to join a challenge study, feeling like there are other people in the military who volunteer to be a hero. There are nurses and doctors on the front lines who are being um, COVID heroes in the, in the face of a lot of risk. This is my way I could volunteer to be a hero. But research ethics has drawn a line um, with how much risk is acceptable. So I want to spend a minute on what are the risks of phase three trials, because to some degree, this debate has been set up about it in, in the language of, is it okay to go to this much uh, bigger risk area of a challenge study, or should we stick with the traditional phase three? And that is the frame. But there is something in that frame that sometimes doesn't acknowledge what the risks of a phase three trial are. Phase three trials um, uh, generally, um, of course, have to answer to the same kinds of ethics questions. What will we learn? Is it valuable? Is the study designed to learn that? What are the risks? Have they been minimized? Who are the participants, et cetera? So phase three, traditional phase three COVID vaccine trials, again, which are ongoing around the world, target higher risk populations, healthcare workers, et cetera. So the ethics tension in vaccine phase three trials, and you know, Jeremy had said that he and I got to know each other early over HIV. That's true. I saw that Doug Vossenar is on the call. He and I have had so many conversations about HIV and ethics, and he's done so much great work on ethics and HIV vaccines. The, the tension in any kind of vaccine phase three trial is that ethically, and the research ethics committee spends so much time on this, you must counsel every single participant to protect themselves. In this case, every participant is told, yes, you're in a vaccines trial, but we don't know whether the vaccine's gonna work. We don't know whether you're getting the experimental vaccine or placebo. You must do everything you would have done if you weren't in the trial, to keep wearing your masks, to distancing, to wash your hands, et cetera. And yet, the trial fails to learn anything unless people get exposed and then become infected. So there's this complicated trade-off that on the one hand, we're duty bound to say to people, protect yourselves. And on the other hand, we don't really learn anything unless there are little breakdowns in the degree to which they are protecting themselves. And ultimately, um, there is a need for them to be exposed. There is also empirical data that so many people, including several of us, have done in other kinds of research to evaluate empirically, whether people who have gone through a robust informed consent study understand their level of risk the same way the researchers do. And unfortunately, and it's an important caution, people in uh, trials that provide preventive interventions, um, whether they are vaccines or other kinds of preventive interventions, tend to overestimate uh, their likelihood of truly being protected. So, um, it would not be a leap to believe that, that some numbers of those 30,000 people in the big trial that just ended actually believe now that they're safer. And there's a question about how much disinhibition, how much um, uh, a little bit more likelihood of slippage of those safety procedures in their own lives they're going to do. So um, this is a little clip related to the Moderna trial, which is one of the ones, um, this is a, a local company for us. 
um, in Maryland in the United States. They have targeted frontline workers, people of color, and their um, public statement said of the 30,000 participants, 53 need to become sick with COVID. And the company expects that to happen in the second half of November. And the second milestone is that of those 53 who become ill, at least 40 need to be participants who received the placebo, which would show the vaccine is 75% effective. So just highlighting this ethical tension. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, this is a point where I know there's gonna be great discussion and I can't wait to see what all of you think. Um, and I'm curious what you think, but also why you think it. What are the justifications and what would you rank, recommend if it were your decision? So with that, Jeremy and CJ, thanks so much. And I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Nancy. You covered a, a, an enormous landscape, um, which, was, um, which is terrific. And um, it, you can see from some of the participants on the uh, webinar that we have some people who've been um, thinking about this issue on both sides, as you point out. Um, Ruth Macklin um, jumped into the game um, early on, and um, uh, she's got a nice um, blog piece on, um, on challenge studies in COVID that I've, I've seen. And her first question was, uh, what's, how relevant is the speed argument given the number of vaccines that are already in phase three for COVID? Yeah, that's a great question. And hello, Ruth Macklin. What a delight to see your face. Um, so uh, I have a couple of answers to that. The first is the, you know, Ruth, as you, you of all people know, these arguments were actually being made months and months ago. So they were being made before the phase, some of the phase three trials were becoming more fully enrolled. At the time when they were being made, one can argue it was, it was particularly relevant for some of the vaccines that now are nearing the end of their testing. But I think it's also, and I will say, if it turns out that um, we learn collectively from a couple of these phase three trials going that the vaccines that they are testing are safe and effective and can be manufactured quickly, I agree with you. I think this becomes a moot question. I think we also know from the trajectory of so much promising research over decades and decades that there's also a chance that some of these trials that are currently near finishing are not going to conclude that the vaccine that they are testing is both safe and effective. And that means that some of the other 90 something vaccine candidates that are further behind in the testing chronology will be getting ready to be tested. And so then that same, then we're back to the beginning of, okay, now there's another vaccine, the seventh vaccine, the 12th vaccine candidate that has finished its phase one, two early safety immunogenicity testing is at that early promising stage. Um, and at that point, I think the speed question becomes relevant. Again, I'm not in any way trying to argue that that is um, ought to be the uh, determinative factor, but I do think it um, is potentially still relevant. Great, so um, thanks. If, if you do have questions, please put them in the, in the chat box. Um, uh, if not, um, I'm just, well, while, you're, while you're thinking up your questions, um, I'm gonna, I'll just raise um, something. So I, I was in discussions with some of the scientists who were interested in the possibility of doing both the phase, the large phase three kind of trials and the challenge studies. And one of the concerns that they raised early on is that there wasn't yet a, uh, a model for how to infect people uh, with, um, with COVID-19 um, at the beginning. So that the, the actual sort of responsible scientific way, as I understood it, of developing a model actually takes months and months and months and months. And so part of what undermined the speed argument is that there wasn't an effective way, uh, like there is a good malaria model for infectivity, and I wondered if, if that combined with the, um, the fact that we're still just learning what are the correlates of immunity of, um, of COVID uh, plays a role in, in the assessments of the ethical acceptability of moving forward with a challenge study. Yeah, 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 that's great. So, um, so, so, we, so, so I, I think, but tell me if I'm wrong, Jeremy, that there's sort of two kinds of ideas embedded in your question. One is, are scientists actually 
ready to start a, a COVID challenge trial? If, if there were a candidate, and there clearly are some candidates, could they tomorrow launch the COVID trial or is there more work that needs to be done? Yeah. The second is um, with, with more uncertainty about exactly how the challenge ought to be done, does that somehow correlate with more risk? M might it turn out that the, um, the way that someone is exposed means that they actually are getting a far greater exposure or that by getting it directly injected rather than aerosolized that somehow it, it causes a different kind of disease. So there's yeah. both the sort of how uncertainty and there's the risk uncertainty and they both become really important. Um, you know, having having said that, to be clear, as you know, that's not my expertise, but it sounds to me that the group in the UK, which is thinking much more seriously about this, has people working on each of these pieces. I, I will, um, I guess I will say that my bias toward uh, trust in the scientific process leads me to think that people wouldn't start those trials until some of that had been worked out. But, but it's also, you know, it, it's probably also an argument for keeping it small. But, but having said that, you should chime in because my guess is you know more about this. No, 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 I, I think it's, it's just a, a area of, it's continuing, like we're learning day by, every day we're learning more and more about this virus and what it means and how it infects people and, and, and what the correlates of protection are and, and things like that. But I was reminded in this in this discussion is that wonderful piece by um, Alex London and Jonathan Kimmelman about uh, COVID exceptionalism and whether the rush, um, given this this global public health emergency, pushes us to potentially sacrifice our nor usual norms of science and expectations, and that that could be worrisome. So that was I think that was the part that 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 got me. That's that was my take home message. I think there's um, another question that just came in um, yeah. that says, have pharmaceutical companies insured the participants for long-term side effects? Um, and, and insured, I th I'm assuming, really means literally like, like provided health insurance coverage. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure the answer is no. And as a matter of fact, um, <laughs> In the New York Times, which for me is one of my great sources of scientific information, there was actually an article in the last week that was addressing that very problem. Obviously, there are trials going globally, and some people, um, like in the United Kingdom, where we're talking about the challenge studies, um, have a different kind of health, uh, national health system and policy than we do in the United States. So there are going to be some countries where these trials are done, where that sort of built into the structure and culture before it came along. In the United States, that's not true. And um, my understanding is that that has not been insured, insured or insured um, in the United States. Having said that, and again, there may be people on the call who've done much more work on research-related injury than I have. There is um, a norm in some parts of the world, including squarely in the United States, to not guarantee insurance for research-related harms up front. And yet, when the research-related harms emerge, and it's clear that they were research-related harms, the researchers or the institution or the sponsor very often does come in quietly and pay for it. But that's not a guarantee for the participant. The other thing that I will say is that um, there, one might anticipate that there will be a disagreement about what counts as a research-related harm. So if the vaccine itself causes you to be paralyzed, I think that will more squarely be agreed upon as a research-related harm. If the vaccine fails and you get COVID and you have long-term sequelae of COVID or you're in the placebo group and you get COVID and you die or you have long-term sequelae, is that a research-related harm or is that something that would have happened anyway if you're in the phase three trial? Or it's, So I think that also is a, a important thing to um, for people to be talking more about right now. Right. 
That's, that's great. So there are a couple more questions in the chat, which is fantastic and keep them coming. Um, first, um, uh, my friend and colleague Tamara from uh, NUS writes, following from that question, the challenge trial in the UK is proposing to infect participants without any vaccine to establish the dosage need, needed. How does that change the way the, uh, the way risk benefit tension? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you, how many of you teach the Willowbrook study, right? <laughs> um, really, it's, it's a, it, I, 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 um, I really don't say that entirely in jest because that was exactly the argument for that particular piece for those of you who do teach or have studied the Willowbrook study, which was really a, a series of six different studies. Um, there was a, a, a place in their chronology when they wanted to test whether their proposed approach to preventing hepatitis um, was effective and they wanted to test it through a challenge mechanism, they had one of their sub-studies was trying to figure out how to do the challenge and essentially how much exposure was needed to, to get this. So it is, it is um, somewhat similar. So um, this rests, I think, on the same, my assumption is that the people who are proponents, uh, not only proponents of challenge studies scientifically, but who believe that the risk can be managed, because that's really the big ethics question. Can the risk be managed or can the risk not be managed? My hypothesis is that the people who are proponents of challenge studies believe that this risk can be managed. Because quite honestly, there is not much different between exposing people to COVID at this pre-trial stage than there is to exposing people to COVID in the placebo arm of a challenge study. You are knowingly giving people COVID with not even a chance of experimental protection. And my guess is, that they would say scientifically, as you were saying a minute ago, Jeremy, you need to get the challenge right, both in terms of science and safety. And we, quote unquote, believe that that risk can be managed by um, uh, having people at a hospital, having low risk adults, treating them right away, getting them in the ICU with the best care and remdesivir, et cetera. So, so again, I, I can't speak I'm not going to speak to whether or not it is acceptable, but my guess is that their arguments actually would not be any different. Okay, great. Well, let me pick up on this. So I'm going to take the order, the questions a bit out of order because it follows on uh, a, a bit better, and then we'll come back to the other, the earlier question. So uh, Kamanthri, hi Kamanthri, uh, writes that the solidarity <laughs> trial has reported that remdesivir is not efficacious, um, so there's little to offer. Um, and what, what, are you, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Yeah, 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 great question. And of course, at the same time, in the United States, our Food and Drug Administration just approved it, right? So there's, um, there's some controversy there. There are other, you know, <laughs> and some of us are from the United States, and I'm sorry I keep mentioning the United States so much, but it's, um, uh, my goodness, we have, you know, I wish it were simply intellectually fascinating, but we have a fascinating case study going on across our entire country, not to mention with the president of our country who got COVID and then tried every treatment approved or experimental in the, in the um, around. There, there, I mention that because obviously there are other interventions that people use. You know, the UK was where the study came out about the effectiveness of steroids at, at certain points. Um, supportive care and good ICU management from people who now are understanding better um, uh, what COVID does and what it requires um, has obviously gets better and better and better as these hardworking clinicians get more and more experienced. So I, you know, I, I think your point is extremely well taken that um, nobody should go into this trial thinking that there's a clear rescue medicine. It is very different than 
um, a certain kind of challenge study where they know that if they give you the right antibiotics afterwards, even though you might feel sick and horrible for a couple of weeks, you are going to be fine. That is not the case here. And this gets back to the same thing about the uncertainty of risk and how much uncertainty research ethics ought to tolerate. So, um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Okay. Great. So now we have a couple of related questions. Um, the first one is, can you please elaborate on pandemic ethics influence on, on COVID-19 challenge trials? And another one um, says that since COVID-19 has been declared as a pandemic, there's a high level of fear and anxiety among the public. How could the volunteers not be misled with the higher chance of getting access to the potential scarce vaccine earlier than other people? Um, with no proven treatment of COVID-19, how could the vaccine challenge study to be ethically ethical, especially when the long-term sequelae and other complications are frequently reported among the survivors? Yeah, 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 it's a good question. So, so I think there is no way of getting around that. I'm not gonna stop at that, but I wanna start with that. In other words, the, <laughs> the, the people who are, who wanna be early in line for a vaccine, whether it's really early in line in a trial, or early in line once it's approved, are people who presumably on some, let's assume that there's a range of reasons. Some have to do with public responsibility and this idea of being a hero, like I'm willing to step forward and help the world. Um, I'm not a doctor or nurse. I can't do everything that they can do to be a hero, but I can volunteer. So there is some amount of that. And of course the pandemic is, is going to be, um, affecting that. And there are people, right? There are the people who um, jump into a wide range of disasters to help other people. And that, you know, I don't know if it's personality type or a gene or, you know, whatever, but there are those people. So that's, that certainly um, exists. And I think we need to um, acknowledge that. There, there certainly could be some amount of self-interest here of people who want early access. I mean, it, it is, um, you know, it's pretty important for those people to know that if nothing else, there's a 50% chance that they will get a placebo. And, you know, there's, there, again, there is a reasonably high failure rate in so many phase three trials even. So, um, so, so, so I guess, I guess part of me feels like the fact that the people who join trials may have a slightly different outlook or uh, personality threshold about risk than other people is to me a fact and not a problem. And I want to start with that. There are people who join, there are people who join certain research studies that I would never join. And I don't think that means that there's something delusional about those people. I just think there are different risk thresholds. But having said that, it becomes critically important to do all sorts of um, I'll use loosely the word tests of understanding among people who join these vaccine trials, whether they're phase three or challenge studies, to make sure that people don't say things like, well, I wanted to be the first one. I'm high risk, so I wanted to be the first. I wanted to get a first chance to get something that's going to protect me. It's like, mm -mm. don't go in there thinking that this is your first chance to have something protect you. We have no idea if this is going to protect you. Again, those of those of us on the call who've been around long enough to, to have thought about ethics in HIV vaccines will remember that that was the context in which tests of understanding as a condition for joining research really took hold. There was so much concern in the HIV vaccine context that people would go into research for exactly that reason, thinking, oh my gosh, HIV is everywhere. I need something to protect me. Let me join one of these trials without realizing that um, it might not be protective, not to mention that half the people didn't get it. And, and this sort of systemizing within as almost as part of an informed consent process that we need to really figure out what people understand and what they don't um, couldn't be more important than in these trials. So, yeah, so building on that, um, Nancy, that, that as you, as you know, um, Kevin Whiteford and I have done some work on something we've coined the preventive misconception. So even beyond the moment of enrollment, and going to uh, understanding, what we found is that people who enrolled in HIV prevention trials anyway, 
um, hold a preventive misconception where they erroneously believe that whatever is being tested is certainly going to be effective. And our worry would be that they would take increased uh, risks as a result of that. Um, so there is a question on point uh, to that to challenge um, your, if you will, challenge. I like that. Um, challenge the, the question you raised before about um, liability issues in the trial. Um, uh, if people in the placebo get infected, why don't we say it is related to the trial as these people may become less strict in the other preventive methods thinking that the vaccine may protect them? So Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So this gets back to this. this I, I agree with you, Jeremy. You've done great work on this. This is this idea that, again, people who like lingo call disinhibition, that there's something about the belief system that people get into when they join a preventive trial that could um, lead some numbers of those participants to um, take on even more risks because they feel more protected. It's sort of like they're, <laughs> you know, there there are always questions that can, I'm, I'm a corp, you know, public health person, and there are always questions that come up of um, if you put a helmet on a bicyclist, do they go even faster? If you put a helmet on a motorcyclist, do they take more risks? If you know, there, there's always this question of when you when you put something in place, does it change people's behavior? And this becomes an even, it becomes a question that makes all of us even more anxious if the thing you're putting in place, you don't even know whether it works, right? There will be a, one day, let's hope we have approved COVID vaccines. And there will be a question about whether that leads us to take on risks that we shouldn't take. But my goodness, here we are at the level of a research trial where we don't even know whether this thing works, not to mention whether people um, get it. So this, again, gets back to this question. So I'm not going to be able to give an answer. I mean, I, um, I certainly think that it's very credible based on so much empirical research that has been done in other parallel contexts that this will happen, that there will be people who join trials who despite what we all think is a good informed consent process and even some of those quizzes in an almost unconscious way, just feel a little bit more comfortable spending a lot of time indoors with people and not always having their mask on, spending a little bit more time at the bedside of a sick patient and not quite having all the protective gear on. Whatever is, you know, being the one who volunteers to take care of the sick family member when nobody else um, is able to do that, who knows what it is? And so I think it is reasonable to think that. Um, it gets into this problem that always frustrates me because I keep thinking it's always the wrong, because of the context in which so many of us live, certainly in the United States, I get so frustrated, but there's nothing to do with my frustration, that there is this question about did the research cause that infection and therefore should do the research, um, does the research team or sponsor owe that participant something when obviously anybody who gets sick with COVID needs good care. Like, I get so frustrated that we get into this question of like, does that person deserve it to be paid for? Yes or no. It's like, everybody deserves it to be paid for. And so, I, you know, I'm just sharing this frustration because I find it so, I mean, my goodness, speaking of ethical problems, for us to start to get into these debates about whether certain people should have their COVID care covered, like outrageous. But it is a, a situation that we live in in the United States and it's, if nothing else, that needs to be worked out in advance, um, particularly in countries like mine. Mm -hmm. I think that's the next question. That's what's the level of certainty there will ever be an effective COVID vaccine? Uh, HIV still does not have a vaccine. What's the likelihood of COVID will have the same results? Uh, and does, the change, does that change the risk-benefit ratio in that sense? Yeah. So um, to be clear, my background is not science, so I am not going to be the right person to speak to how the ways in which COVID as a virus is or isn't similar to HIV. I, so I, I'm afraid I can't, I can't help that. What I, what I will say, which is a little bit where I, um, so, uh, so, something that is, that is occurring to me in relation to this is, um, with all vaccines, like with all medicines that ultimately get approved by any of our regulatory agencies, there's only so much we learn at the point when they get approved. There are particular thresholds that need to be met 
in order for regulators to say, yes, we can now put this on the market. But then whether it's, you know, formally through phase four trials or through other kinds of um, uh, registries and experience, it may take years before it becomes clear just how safe and efficacious something is. I mean, 30,000 people on the one hand is a lot. There's a lot more than that in the, in, you know, in the world who are then going to be vaccinated. And that will be when um, people start to learn. I, I, I also would assume, again, as I keep saying, I'm not a scientist, not to mention a vaccine scientist, but it seems like um, there are a fair number of vaccines once approved that a few years later get sort of um, version two developed. So if there is, a, let us all hope through whatever mechanism that there comes to be a vaccine or two or three vaccines that are approved and are you know, at, the, at the regulatory threshold for safety and efficacy. I wouldn't be surprised if, if there is ultimately sort of COVID vaccine 2.0 a year later. I mean, we've seen that with shingles vaccine, we've seen it with HPV. I mean, there, it's not uncommon that there gets to be a sort of um, a, a better, even more protective version a year or two later when we learn more. So great. So um, we, we're down to five minutes. So what I figured do, there are a few more uh, questions. Why don't I just read those out to you and then you can pick whichever you'd like and we can finish up on, on time. How's that? So um, the first is uh, just wondering, would the consent form specify that the subject may die as a result of joining the research due to uncertainty of COVID? Another uh, question goes, do risks evaluation include risks of low uptake of vaccine when approved because of all of those pushing for speeding up the trials and associated belief it was done cutting corners? Um, in a different angle, how paternalistic do we have the right to be in relation to volunteering or even denying volunteers the opportunity to participate? It sounds more paternalistic than the practice of medicine. And, um, Two lap. Oh my goodness! We're, we're we're now now everybody's coming in. It's uh it's great. Um, if two thirds of people in some area will be vaccinated to get herd immunity, but the trial is not finished yet, there are no results of clinical phase three yet. The reason for vaccination is emergency use authorization. Is it unethical? Trick. Quite understand. That yeah. Part. Okay. I'm not sure I understand that question, so I'm going to jump in with the other three. How's that? Okay. And then with apologies. Um, and I'm gonna, we have one last one from Doug Wassenaar. Um, uh, in the preventive HIV vaccine field, there's generally empirically a higher level of preventive education and prevention trials than in the general at-risk public. And data showed that risk behavior among participants was no more dis disinhibited, if not better, if I remember correctly, in a match non-participant samples. But the risk of din disinhibition must be addressed actively by RECs, IRBs, and PIs. So again, yeah. a bunch yeah. of different kinds of questions there that you can you can pick and choose at the market. The question. Mark. Yeah, great. So and and Doug's I'm going to take to be a really helpful comment to go into the mix from empirical data. So thanks, Doug. So I'm not going to I I don't take that to be a question I should answer. Uh, do do consent forms talk about death? I haven't seen one, but I would be shocked if they didn't. I mean, I I, I think that's pretty typical in any kind um, of study. I, I will say there, there is sometimes a debate in the research ethics world about how much to talk about the risk of the disease rather than the risk of the product. So let's even think about a traditional phase three trial. Um, do you talk about um, the risks of the vaccine only or do you also talk about um, the risk of getting COVID? But Mike, I would be shocked in this environment currently if the, if if consent forms didn't say something about what COVID was and the fact that some people in all age groups um, have, a, have a risk of death. Um, should, should, should we think about vaccine um, hesitancy when we think about societal benefit? My own view is no. I could go into a lot of reasons why. It's not that I'm not concerned about vaccine hesitancy. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply and profoundly concerned about it. I do think, however, that vaccine hesitancy will diminish when some numbers of people step forward and if we're, if all goes the way it should, um, do okay. So there will be, let's pretend even only 20% of, of let's say my country are willing to be step forward and be vaccinated. That's a lot of people. 
And if it turns out that they do okay, six months later, there will be more people willing to step forward. I um, mean, is it paternalistic? It's completely paternalistic. I mean, this is, as I said, this is the tension in research ethics. Research ethics committees are bound to be protectionist and also to some degree to let people take on certain risks. But this is, you know, we, we do this to some degree in clinical care. People are not allowed to, um, well, I, I won't go into it, we don't have time, but there, there, are, there are all sorts of things, but particularly in research ethics where we are protectionist. And ultimately in my experience, every research ethics committee draws the line at slightly different places. So we're at the hour, I'm gonna stop right there. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Nancy, for an amazing um, session and leaving enough time for a, for a good discussion with folks who joined the webinar. And it was a, a really great way for us to wake up and I hope a nice way for you to go to, <laughs> go to sleep and uh, at, at, you know, sleep with this great discussion in mind. Um, so please join us in the future um, for the other Hot Topics of Research Ethics series. Um, we will be, uh, you'll hear about them in the same way. And also, for those of you interested, please check out the Moray's website. Um, we're always looking for great people to join us and engage in questions like this over time. And uh, thanks to the NIH again for support to make this possible. Um, hope everyone has a good day or a good evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>